Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the Presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of William McKinley, and the focus is the McKinley Tariff. The year is 1881, and McKinley is back in the House of Representatives for his third term, same time that James Garfield of Ohio, also from Ohio, is inaugurated as the 20th President of the United States, and Garfield did a little bit of pushing to help McKinley land an open spot on the House Ways and Means Committee. One of the most important committees in Congress that focused on the economy, and McKinley had already latched onto the tariff as his critical personal issue, so this was going to be a great fit. The trend on the tariff actually was moving in the opposite direction. McKinley we wanted high protective tariffs. But a lot of the country, including many Republicans, thought the tariffs should come down. There was excess cash sitting in the Treasury vaults. They've been running surpluses the last couple of years. Maybe bring those rates down and bring prices down too. Not McKinley. He felt protection was necessary for American industry and American workers, and that's the way he would always believe. Well, in 1882, you go to the next election cycle, and this would be McKinley's closest election in his entire career. 34,000 votes were cast, and the margin of victory, eight votes. The winner was William McKinley. Eight votes is still a win. A win is a win. He's back to Washington, D.C., sworn in, going on with the work of Congress. But in the meantime, the Democrats cried foul. They asked for a recount. It was so close. They looked particularly at some misspellings that they believed should have been awarded in the other direction. The State Board of Elections was controlled by the Democrats. And sure enough, they overturned enough votes that the new winner was the Democrat Jonathan Wallace. All of a sudden, in May of 1884, this took months, but in May of 1884, William McKinley was out of a job. He was removed from his role as a congressman in the House of Representatives, but not for long. It was an election year already again in 1884. He tossed his hat back in the ring. He won his seat back basically turned out to be just an extended vacation. And he was busy during that time as well because 1884, another presidential election year, meant a National Republican Convention. McKinley went as a delegate and he got the honor to be the chair of the Resolutions Committee. This meant that he was the chair of the committee that actually drafted the party platform. In terms of candidates for the nomination, McKinley was there to support his fellow Ohioan John Sherman. Sherman lost the nomination to James Blaine of Maine, the former Speaker of the House. Blaine goes up against Grover Cleveland, the Democratic governor of New York. Cleveland wins the presidency, and that's going to mean something to William McKinley because Cleveland was anti-high tariff. McKinley wanted the high protective tariff. Cleveland wanted those tariff rates to come down. In fact, in 1887, he felt so strongly about this, he did something that no president had ever done before. He took his annual message to Congress, and he focused it entirely on one issue. That issue was the tariff and a full-throated advocacy to bring down those tariff rates. Well, William McKinley wasn't going to have this. He thought it was the wrong policy, and he said so. According to McKinley, we put a burden upon his products, his being foreign producers. We discriminate against his merchandise because he is alien to us and our interests. And we do it to protect, defend, and preserve our own, who are always with us in adversity and prosperity, in sympathetic purpose, and if necessary, in sacrifice. The proper approach to McKinley, high tariff, protect U.S. industry, protect U.S. jobs. Now, Grover Cleveland did help push a bill through the House of Representatives to bring those tariff rates down, but that bill died in the Senate. This battle, though, was really just beginning. Move ahead to the next election cycle, 1888. The economy very much on the ballot, the tariff, and also the currency. Grover Cleveland, renominated by the Democrats. The uh, Republicans met in Chicago, and William McKinley kind of deja vu for him a little bit. He was there once again to support John Sherman, once again was the chair of the Resolutions Committee, charge of the party platform, and once again that platform was for a protective tariff. According to the platform, we are uncompromisingly in favor of the American system of protection. We protect against its destruction as proposed by the president and his party. They serve the interest of Europe. We will support the interest of America. When it came time to actually have the nominations then and the roll call vote for the nomination for the Republican for president, 1888, 13 different names got votes, including in the first ballot, a couple for William McKinley. But he was there again to support Sherman. Sherman had a big lead on the first ballot, but it became pretty clear as the day went along that there wasn't going to be a path to a majority for Sherman. So that night, there was a lot of backroom politicking trying to figure out maybe they needed to find a dark horse to introduce and push for. And some of those delegates went to see McKinley and asked him, look, if we put your name and put some force behind this tomorrow, would you be okay with being that dark horse candidate? 
McKinley said, absolutely not. According to McKinley, he told them it shall never be. If you do that, I will rise in the convention and denounce it. His personal pride, his honor was at stake. He was there to support Sherman, and he wasn't going to back away from that. Well, what happened the next day, some of his friends, sure enough, did push his candidacy. He got up to 11 votes in the delegate count, and he actually decided it was time to stand up and put an end to this. McKinley told the convention, I would not respect myself if I could find it in my heart to do so or permit to do that, which could even be ground for anyone to suspect that I wavered in my loyalty to Ohio or my devotion to the chief of her choice and the chief of mine. I do not request. I demand that no delegate who would not cast reflection upon me shall cast a ballot for me. Now, this was probably deja vu for John Sherman, because you go back to the 1880 Republican convention just eight years before, and the same thing seemed to have happened. Once again, James Garfield was there to support John Sherman. There was a deadlock. They decided to actually, the convention decided to put Garfield's name forward as a dark horse candidate. Garfield stood up and said, no, 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 not me. I'm here to support Sherman. They shouted him down, and Garfield got the nomination and the presidency. This time, didn't happen again. McKinley's words actually echoed and were re resonated with the folks in the, in the crowd. They turned in a different direction. They went to Indiana. Benjamin Harrison got the nomination. And as far as McKinley was concerned, this was good news because Harrison was very much in favor of protection. Rutherford Hayes, who had been a mentor for uh, McKinley ever since their days together during the Civil War, thought that McKinley handled himself perfectly throughout this particular mess. Hayes told him that you gained gloriously. The test was a severe one, but you stood it manfully, a better crown than to have been nominated for taking his stand on principle. There was also at this convention a bit of a changing of the guard in the Republican Party in the state of Ohio. A couple of the major power brokers were Mark Hanna and Joseph Foraker. Hanna was a businessman and he raised a lot of money to help particular Republican candidates. He was there to support John Sherman, as was Foraker, who was the governor of Ohio. But as Sherman's support started to wane, Foraker actually left that camp and went in a different direction. This created some bad blood between Hanna and Foraker and they effectively split politically. Where did Hannah end up? Pretty much in the camp of William McKinley. Now, this was really an odd couple. If you look at them on one hand, they were very, very different. On the other, they were perfect complements. Hannah was sort of larger than life, while William McKinley was very much down to earth. Hannah sort of rough, maybe impetuous, whereas McKinley was dignified and patient. On policy, they were very much aligned. Nationalistic principles, very much focused on the high tariff, personally very different, but very complementary as their relationship would develop over time. Now, Harrison did get the nomination. He edged Grover Cleveland for the presidency. The Republicans had a majority in the House. This was finally McKinley's chance to push through that high tariff. But first, he had something else to deal with. His wife was sick again. Ida McKinley had not been well now for several years, and she had started to really lean and rely upon McKinley for practically everything. She would be constantly sort of asking him to do favors for her, and frankly, he didn't mind. He would stop what he was doing. He couldn't do enough for her. In fact, when they were not together, he would often send telegrams, you know, three or four messages a day just to let her know that he was thinking of her. He was completely devoted to his wife. And right now they had their greatest scare. She was in Canton, Ohio. He's in Washington, D.C., and he gets word that she has a fever. It's not abating. She's in and out of consciousness. So McKinley gets on a train, the first one he can catch. He gets to Canton, Ohio. He races home from the train station, bounds up the stairs, and he finds Ida McKinley in bed unconscious. He stays the entire night with her. He's holding in her hands. He's praying. She wakes up the next morning, looks at him, and says ever so simply, I knew you would come. And he did, and he nursed her back to health. Again, all of these political things aside, top priority for William McKinley was always going to be his wife, Ida McKinley. Actually, after she got better, it was back to Washington. Congress convened. And before McKinley settled back into Ways and Means to focus on the tariff, he actually tossed his hat into the ring for another office, Speaker of the House of Representatives. He thought he'd have a chance at that, and his main opposition was Thomas Reed of Maine. Again, very different. Reed, aggressive, kind of a biting wit. And Reed had some more experience, the previous chair, the Judiciary Committee, the Rules Committee, and eventually Reed won the prize. But the consolation prize actually went to McKinley because not only did he go back to Ways and Means, Reed named him the chairman. So now he'd have a chance not only to be a part of legislation for a high tariff, he'd have the chance to push it as the chair of the key committee. Again, the sectional interests really trumped party interests here when it came to the tariff. 
the folks in the South and in the West, primarily the, the folks who were focused on raw materials, farmers, they wanted low tariff. In the East and the North, the manufacturing center, they wanted the high tariff. The president of the United States, Benjamin Harrison now, pro-high tariff, William McKinley high tariff, but McKinley wasn't in a rush. He really was methodical about this. He held dozens of hearings. He tried to listen to all sides, consider duties on over a thousand different items. Then an interesting twist came into play. Harrison's Secretary of State was James Blaine. James Blaine, very respected in a prominent Republican in terms of party leadership. And now as Secretary of State, he was pro-protection, high tariff, but he was also trying to negotiate some deals, some trade deals with some South American countries. And he came up with the idea of, in addition to having as the default, the high tariff that they were pushing for, but to have an opt-out for the executive to negotiate reciprocity deals. What were those? Well, they were bilateral trade agreements of free trade on particular products between just two countries. And the idea was that we'll keep the protection in there if we can't get these free trade agreements on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but if we can, that's good for both importers and exporters, and we should give the president and the executive the opportunity to do that. Well, McKinley originally was not in favor of this. This was counter to what he had sort of always been preaching, but over time he actually started to come around and believe this was okay and the reciprocity, reciprocity opportunity for the executive was included in what was now being called the McKinley tariff. That tariff really increased rates, the highest peacetime rates in American history. They jumped from 38.5% on average to 49.5% on average. Now, as far as McKinley was concerned, this was a nationalistic kind of vote for the people who were going to have to vote on it. According to McKinley, this bill is an American bill. It is made for the American people and American interests. There was some contentious debate, particularly in the Senate but it did pass both houses, signed into law by Benjamin Harrison. And one of the interesting things, again, about McKinley is no matter how difficult these negotiations had been, very contentious at times, nobody ever seemed to have a bad word to say about McKinley personally. He was that likable. One example, Congressman Robert LaFollette of Wisconsin said, he, McKinley, never had a harsh word for a harsh word, but rather a kindly appeal. Come now, let us put the personal element aside and consider the principle involved. Political differences with McKinley, for sure. Personal animosity, almost non-existent throughout his entire career. But there were ramifications of the McKinley tariff, and they weren't good ones for McKinley and, in fact, the Republican Party. The midterm elections were right after the passage of this tariff, and it was a bloodbath for the Republicans. They lost over half their seats in the House of Representatives, as the electorate really was not aligned to the direction that Harrison, McKinley, and others were taking the country. Among those who lost their jobs in the House, was William McKinley. He lost his race by about 300 votes. He was out of a job, still convinced that he was taking the country on the right path, but the electorate at this point in time felt otherwise. He was out of office, not for long though, and that is the story for another day. That is William McKinley and the McKinley Tariff from the life of William McKinley. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.